Good morning, everyone. If I say to you, Whakarongo Mai, what am I asking you to do? That's right, I'm asking you to listen here or listen to me. We are currently in the middle of the New Zealand Baptist Missionary Society's Renew Together campaign. Renew Together is the new name for self denial. The purpose of the Renew Together campaign is to raise awareness of and funds for the work of NZBMS. For three Sundays, we're using the sermon time to focus on some of the core values of NZBMS. Last week, we explored the value of mutual humility. Today, we consider the value of whakarongo, or listening. In the deeper sense, the word whakarongo means more than just listening physically with our ears. It refers to feeling, sensing, and perceiving. Spiritually speaking, things happen when we listen to and obey God's word. This idea of listening to God and following his voice comes up time and time again in the Bible. The focus of our message today is Isaiah 43 verses 16 to 21. Isaiah was an Old Testament prophet. From verse 16 we read, This is what the Lord says, He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honour me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. May the Spirit of Jesus illuminate God's word for us. In a nutshell, today's reading is saying, don't be blinded by the past, be open to the future. This, of course, requires us to listen to God. Alexander Graham Bell was a scientist, an engineer, and an inventor. He's probably most famous for inventing the telephone. Alexander Bell became interested in the science of sound because both his mother and his wife were deaf. He himself was a teacher of the deaf. It was his experiments in sound that led to the invention of the telephone. While the first telephone wasn't all that useful to the deaf, later developments in phone technology like texting have made communication by distance accessible to the deaf community. Alexander Bell came up with a listening device that for centuries before him, no one had perceived would be possible. He was not blinded by the past. He was open to the future and to new possibilities. It was Alexander Bell who gave us the wisdom of this saying. Sometimes we stare so long at the door that is closing that we see too late the one that is open. In other words, don't be blinded by the past. Be open to the future. Returning to today's scripture, in 586 BC, the city of Jerusalem was conquered by the Babylonians and the survivors from the tribe of Judah were forced into exile in Babylon. The challenge for the Jewish exiles was to maintain their identity as God's chosen people while living in a foreign land. Remembering the stories of their past, how God had delivered them from slavery in Egypt, was one of the ways the people in captivity maintained their identity. The old familiar stories also had a soothing effect. They were a comfort, like a security blanket. Second Isaiah, which includes chapter 43, was written for the Jewish exiles in Babylon. So it comes as a surprise when the prophet says in verse 18, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. This is especially jarring because recalling the past is exactly what Isaiah has just been doing. In verses 16 and 17, the prophet makes a clear reference to the first exodus when Yahweh led the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. So what's going on here? Well, it's probably a rhetorical device designed to get people's attention. 
Isaiah moves from the familiar to the unfamiliar. It's a poetic way of saying, Whakarongo mai, listen carefully here. More than just getting people's attention, though, Isaiah was probably aware that dwelling on the past too much was holding people back. The past can become an idealised world into which we retreat when the future becomes too frightening to face. The Jewish exiles were at risk of looking so long at a door that had closed that they would miss the new door God was opening. Israel's attachment to nostalgia threatened to blind them to new possibilities and prevent them from moving forward. Isaiah does not want Israel to retreat into the past. He does want them to remember God's power and faithfulness, though. Not dwelling too long on the past isn't just a warning against a retreat from present realities. It may also mean don't spend all your time thinking about what they did to you and how they hurt you all those years ago. There is a time and place for lament, but once you've got it out of your system, once you've expressed your grief, don't wallow in self-pity and resentment. Keep pressing on. Perhaps, too, forgetting the former things carries the meaning of forgiving yourself, not condemning yourself for your past mistakes. Israel went into exile because of their disloyalty and their injustice. Fifty years is a long time to be in exile, a long time to live with regret. The people were going to need all their energy for what God was planning to do next. They could not afford to carry their past mistakes with them. What is it that holds you back? What things from the past do you need to spend less time dwelling on? Do you look at the good old days through rose-tinted glasses? Do you spend too much time retreating to the past? Do you hold on to hurts and the cruel things people have said to you? Do you need to grieve that hurt, let it go and move on? Do you dwell too long on your own mistakes, never quite able to atone for your failure? Do you need to trust yourself to God's grace and be on your own side? Don't be blinded by the past. Be open to the future. In verse 19, the Lord says, See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? This is a call to whakarongo, to listen to the Lord, to try and perceive the new thing God is doing, to be open to the future. After some decades, the Babylonian Empire was conquered by the Medes, who took a different approach. In 538 BC, around 50 years after the fall of Jerusalem, King Cyrus released the Jewish exiles, allowing them to return to their homeland to rebuild the Jerusalem temple. This was different. This was not like when their ancestors were slaves in Egypt and Pharaoh became stubborn, refusing to let the people go. Unlike Pharaoh, King Cyrus acted as the servant of the Lord, sending the Jews off with his blessing. The Jews did not need to fight the Medes and Persians. There was, however, some similarity with the past. The returning exiles had to make an epic journey through the wilderness. Unlike the first exodus, though, it didn't take 40 years, probably more like four to six months, depending on the route they travelled. Even so, it would have not been easy. The Jewish exiles had become quite settled in Babylon. Those young enough to make the journey would have been born in exile and would not know anything of their homeland. The prospect of picking up sticks to resettle in Palestine would be quite daunting. They were returning to ruins. They would have to rebuild from scratch. They needed reassurance and encouragement. And so the Lord says in verse 19, I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. This verse can be taken both literally and metaphorically. God was literally making a way in the wilderness for the exiles to return home from Babylon. God was promising to provide all the people needed to rebuild a new life in Jerusalem. At the same time, this verse stands as a metaphor for the exiles and for us. 
Sometimes in life we are faced with trials and difficulties. Not just a bad day, but a prolonged period of hardship. We call this a wilderness experience. A wilderness, a wilderness experience is not something we can avoid. It is something we have to go through. To go through the wilderness is to be vulnerable. When we are in the wilderness, we are conscious of just how small and powerless we really are. The wilderness can be as deadly as it is beautiful. Wilderness experiences come in many forms. For example, a battle with cancer or a war with depression. Going through a divorce can be a wilderness experience. Being made redundant after years of service and wondering what the point of your life is. Losing a child or a spouse or a parent. Losing your home and becoming a refugee. Being forced to flee to another country and start again. Facing a crisis of faith is also a wilderness experience. I could go on, but you get the idea. The wilderness is not an easy or comfortable place to be, and it's hardly ever a place you choose to be. The wilderness tests you beyond what you thought were your limits. When you're in the wilderness, you cannot afford to be blinded by the past. You have to listen. You have to be present. You have to be aware of your environment. You use all your senses just to survive. The wilderness shows you what you're made of and it throws you on the mercy of God. At some point in your wilderness experience, you will think to yourself, I don't think I can carry on. I can't see a way forward. I don't know how I'm going to get out of this situation. And yet somehow God makes a way for you. After you have passed through the wilderness, you may feel like a part of you died there. But you're not sorry for that. You see that it made room for something new to grow. Now you carry a piece of the wilderness in you. You're not necessarily stronger. You may even walk with a limp because of your experience. But you are freer somehow. Have you been through the wilderness? Perhaps you're in the wilderness right now. Let me say to you, the Lord is at home in the wilderness. And that is good news because it means he can make a way for you when you cannot see a way for yourself. He is the way maker. But here's the thing. The way God makes for us is not the same every time. When Job was in the wilderness of unjust su suffering, God met him in a hurricane, a storm. But when Moses was in the wilderness of obscurity, Yahweh met Israel's great leader in a burning bush. When Jacob was in the wilderness on the run from his brother Esau, God gave him a vision of a ladder from heaven to earth with angels ascending and descending. And this vision opened the way for Jacob to move forward into the unknown. But when Elijah was in the wilderness at Mount Horeb, a.k.a. Mount Sinai, the Lord came to him not in a vision and not in the earthquake, wind or fire, but in a gentle whisper, that still, small voice. When Mary and Martha were in the wilderness of grief, after their brother Lazarus had died, the Lord Jesus came in tears. We read that Jesus wept. Then he raised Lazarus from the dead. That was new. That opened the way for many to believe. The idea of God making a way in the wilderness continues in verses 20 and 21 of Isaiah 43, where the Lord says, The wild animals honour me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I form for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. Previously in the book of Isaiah, in chapter 34, we read how the jackals and owls, unclean animals, prowl among the ruins. They were associated with God's judgment and with chaos. Now in chapter 43, Isaiah reintroduces the jackals and the owls not as prowlers, 
but this time as giving honour to God. The image here is one of restoration. God is going to transform the wasteland and the ruins into a place of new life and refreshment. And God's people, the returning exiles, will be witnesses to this, proclaiming God's praise for the way of salvation he has made. The message is one of hope. The very things we dread, the wilderness and wasteland, are often the very things God uses for our salvation. We see the way of God's salvation fulfilled in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. God used the cross, an instrument of cruelty, judgment, and shame, as the instrument of forgiveness, reconciliation, and new life through faith in Jesus. For some time now, the church in the West has been going into exile. The gap between church and society has been growing. Society is going its own way, and the church appears to be in decline. Some might say the church is finding itself in the wilderness. We might feel tempted to retreat into the past, to dwell on the good old days. But we must not be blinded by the past. We must remain open to the future. We do well to remember the good days were not always that good. Truth be told, they were a mixed bag. It also helps to look outward. As we heard last week, the church in places like Africa and Asia is thriving. God is always at work doing a new thing. This does not mean God has forgotten us here in the West, but it does mean we have to be alert. We have to whakarongo, or listen to God. We have to use all our senses to try and perceive what God is doing. We might not be able to see a clear way forward, but God is the way maker. He can create a highway in the desert and streams of new life in the wilderness. Let us pray. Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. You have walked the wilderness and made a way through. We face uncertain times. May we not retreat into the past for fear of the future. Rather, may we be open to the way forward you have created. Help us to hear what you are saying to the church and give us courage to obey your call. Amen.